Okay, as I said, I'm going to take random polls. Today is the day that counts for all of the semester until now. So if you're not here in class and not watching the polls, not taking the polls today, you don't get attendance for the first half of the semester, or the first month of the semester, all right? This is for everybody on Zoom, everywhere. Just keep in mind. Okay, let's begin. Here's where we were so far. We've uh, uh, learned that you train a neural network by minimizing a loss, which is the average divergence between the, the true output of the network and the desired output of the network, which is an approximation to the true risk, which we know is the shaded area in the plot that we saw in earlier classes. We minimize this using gradient descent. And uh, when we perform batch updates, batch updates must process the entire training data before each update, which can be very expensive. So we perform incremental updates, such as with uh, SGD or mini batch. And uh, this is faster to converge, but may have greater variance in the result that you get. We also saw the trend algorithms, momentum and such like, smooth out variations in the incremental update by considering long-term trends and gradients. This can lead to faster and better convergence. So today we're going to sort of move on and look at some, uh, a mix of topics which to close out the series on training neural networks. We're going to look at divergences, normalizations, and various ways of trying to uh, make the model generalize, and a few other tricks, if time permits, if I run out of time, and the slides are going to be on the web, please take a look. As we all know, even if I don't present something in class, it's likely to turn up in the quiz. So first, let's consider the divergence itself. We know that the loss is, a, uh, for, is the average of the divergence over all of the training instances, and so, we also know what it means for the training to converge. Can you guys at the back shut your laptops, please? Uh, so, uh, and, uh, well, what does it mean for a training to converge? Can somebody tell me? Someone at the back, yes. It reaches the local minimum, instead of bouncing around, right? And whether it will converge or not is going to depend on the divergence function that we use. So for instance, if your divergence function had something like this, had a shape like this, is your training ever going to converge? Can I hear it aloud? Everybody say no. no. Thank you, right? So something like this, will it converge? Yes. But it's going to take a long time, and why is that? It's go in the, initially, it's all flat, right? Yes. And then it's going to take many, 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 many steps, and then it's finally going to get to the uh, valley, right? You over there, can you shut your laptop if you don't mind? Yes, thank you, right. Where you really want your divergence to be something like this. You want the slope to be high, far away from the minimum, and small, closer to the minimum. So functions that are shallow, far from the minimum, will result in very small steps in the early phases of your, of your uh, optimization, and even worse, as you get close to the optimum, the function becomes steep, so the step size steps become large. Remember, gradient descent steps are proportional to the, to the steepness itself, and that's likely to make the whole thing bounce and diverge. So although this has a nice, beautiful minimum, you're actually likely to have trouble finding it. Whereas something like this is going to give you exactly the kind of behavior that you want. So, We've seen different kinds of divergences in the past few classes. Just to reiterate, if you have a regression problem where the, uh, the intention is to produce a continuous valued prediction, the divergence we like to use is, uh, uh, wait, wait, are these, I have to, these two, these two things. Yeah, that the divergence we like to use is the L2 divergence, right? I have some, I'm not sure exactly what's going on in my slides, I gotta fix this, which is defined as half of the quadratic distance between what you want and uh, where you want to be. The half is meant to eliminate the uh, factor of two when you actually take the derivative. On the other hand, someone remind me, I gotta fix the slide, okay? <laughs> 
if you're trying to perform a classification task, then the divergence that you like to produce, the, the divergence that you like to compute is, uh, oh, I believe this is single output versus multiple outputs. The slide is fine, right? So uh, the divergence that you like to compute is the callback Leibler divergence between the desired and the actual outputs of the network. Now the natural question over here, it's very obvious. When you're trying to perform regression, the notion of a callback Leibler divergence doesn't really make sense because the output can be anything, right? When you're trying to perform classification, the output is a probability vector. So when it's a probability distribution, while we saw why the KL divergence makes sense, it still uh, doesn't tell us why we cannot use the L2 divergence. I mean, who stopped you from using the L2 divergence when you're trying to predict probabilities? And as we all saw, regardless of whether you're using the KL divergence or the L2 divergence, we got the, the uh, divergence plots themselves were nice and uh, convex. So we saw, for example, that if the, this is the output of the network, the KL divergence looked like this, the L2 divergence looked like this, both of these are convex, so both of these should be acceptable, right? Here is the problem, they're not. So if I take just a single, sim, simple perceptron, this plot, if I take a perceptron, the perceptron has many weights, right? And then you apply an activation, and then you have an output. Now, if you take the, and then, then you compute the divergence out here. So this is why these are the weights. Both divergences, KL and L2, are nice and convex with respect to Y. Yes? I have no idea. What's Minecraft doing on my screen? <laughs> I don't even play it. OK, sorry. Anyway, so both KL and L2 are nice and uh, uh, convex with respect to Y, the output of the final layer. But if you look at them as a function of the weights, this is what L2 looks like. Is this convex? This actually has the ugly shape that we, we didn't want, right? Whereas when you look at the callback labular divergence, that's got a nice bold shape. Which is why when you're dealing with classification problems, you like to use this one and not this one. This is not, this actually doesn't, although with respect to the output, it has the beautiful bowl-like behavior everybody likes. When you look at it as a function of the parameters of the network, you, at the very first layer, things go, things go bad. So one final thing, we call, uh, uh, back propagation is often called error back propagation. Why is that? Now, regardless of whether you're performing regression or whether you're performing classification, at the output layer, there's a two-step process. First, you compute the affine function of the features coming into the output layer. Then you apply an activation to it. If you're performing regression, the activation is just an identity transform. It's your linear uh, activation, which means nothing happens to it. So in the case of regression, y is going to be z equal to z. If you're performing classification, you actually apply a softmax to it. And so the output is going to be a softmax applied to the activation. Now in this case, the obvious loss function is to L2 divergence. So are you looking at the slides? If not, do you mind shutting the laptop? Yes, thank you. Right. So, Whereas in this case, the obvious divergence is the KL divergence. It turns out that regardless of which of these two problems you have, if you take the, div the, the derivative of the L2 divergence with respect to Z in this first case, or if you take the derivative of the KL divergence with respect to Z, again, the affine value in the classification case, it turns out that in both cases, the derivative is just the error between the output of the network and the desired output of the network. Now this is beautiful, right? And this also tells you why the softmax and KL sort of work together. And so you don't even have to think twice. You don't actually, have, I, mean, I mean, it's easy enough to prove if somebody wants to do it on Piazza, you're, you're welcome, or if you want, I can post a peer proof for you. But this makes thinking about propagating derivatives backwards very easy because you know the whole thing is so convenient, yes. 
Wait, wait, wait. This is the callback Leibler divergence. If I said softmax, I'm sorry, right? The output of the softmax, when you have the output of the softmax, you will be using the KL divergence, right? And if you take the derivative of the scale divergence with respect to the affine value before the softmax, that is simply going to be the error. Similarly, over here, if you take the uh, derivative of the L2 divergence with respect to the affine value just before the layer, that is simply going to be the error. The error okay? And so we have our first poll. There are two questions here. These are easy, so. Five seconds, folks. All right, let me continue. Here are the poles. Only the KL divergence is convex with respect to the weights of the final softmax layer. The L2 divergence, is fact, in fact, is not, number one. And number two, both for regression networks with L2 loss and for classification networks with cross entropy loss, the uh, divergent, the gradient with respect to the final affine value is simply going to be the error which is why we always speak of this thing, you know, these are the two most popular problems, right? So we always speak of error back propagation. And so is the story so far. Gradient descent can be sped up by incremental updates. We've seen all of this. The choice of divergence affects both the learned network and the results. If your divergence is not appropriately chosen, your loss function is going to be hideous, and the, and the odds are you're either going to bounce around or you're going to end up in a bad place. So we move on to our next topic, the problem of covariate shifts. So when we train, we work on mini batches. And there's an underlying assumption that we sort of encountered when we were speaking of mini batches in the uh, last class. So how you, can you tell me what that assumption was? Uh, assumption of the mini batch? Mm -hmm. We didn't make it explicit, but can somebody take a guess? Can you take a guess? Yes. IID. Yes, but that's not an assumption. That, that, that is, you know, in most cases that is true, right? Okay. So, Catherine, can you take a guess? Pardon me? The linear, no, we didn't say that, right? So, if I compare the statistics of the mini batch to the statistics of the entire training set, how do you think the two should compare? approximately the same. That is, otherwise the whole thing would not work, right? So that, we are assuming that all of the mini batches basically are sort of stationed where the data are. But then what will really happen is that each mini batch is gonna have a different distribution. So if each of these patches represents a mini batch, all of them are going to be in different locations. And in fact, this spread can be pretty large. There's no, so uh, the uh, fundamental assumption that you begin with may fail. So what would the solution be? The only way, the whole idea behind mini batch descent is that all of the mini batches have similar statistics and that these are similar to the training data itself. So you want to sort of move the mini batches into some common location so that you can apply your standard training uh, paradigms. But then what is this common location? We can't really say because we don't know what the statistics of the data really should look like. All you're seeing are these mini batches, right? And so, and of course, this happens at various layers of the network, so it's hard to predict. So here's what we will do. We are going to move all of the mini batches to one location that everybody is aware of, namely the origin, the zero. It's very easy to locate zero, right? And then we are going to move everything at zero to some location, and we will find out what this location is as part of the training. So this is what we will call batch 
uh, normalization. Here's a pull. Okay, five seconds, guys. This was an easy one. Okay, let's start, okay? So batch norm basically accounts for covariate shifts. We're calling covariate shifts, meaning in the sense that all of these are varying together. There are different ways that in which people define covariate shifts, but then the basic idea is just this, right? They're all shifted, the entire batch has some common ter term that it uses to shift to a new position. So. Uh, this accounts for covariate shifts between mini batches, not for individual instances. You cannot speak of a shift for an individual instance. So how exactly are we going to be performing batch normalization? Again, remember, batch normalization has this two-step process for each mini batch. You're moving the entire thing to origin, and then moving it from origin to a location that you will find out, right? This is going to be done for every single neuron in your network. So you can think of batch normalization as this little box, which, which can be done anywhere, but typically is done between when you compute the affine function at the neuron and when you apply the activation or to the affine value. So this uh, is done independently for each neuron, neuron. So the kind of normalization, because the shifts can, are gonna be different at each neuron. They depend on the weights. They depend on the previous layer. So this is done independently for each neuron. And during training, the actual adjustment, moving things to the right location, is going to be uh, happen over many batches. So, but as a general procedure, here is what happens. You first compute your affine value. Then, as I said, there's a two-step process. The first step moves this affine value to a new location such that it's centralized. And the new location is origin, which means you're going to be canceling out some mean, which is the average location of the mini batch. Or in general, the same process is also going to apply during test time. So it's going to be some centering shift. But then centering is not enough. Each mini batch could have different variances, could have different spreads. So you're also going to be scaling them so that they all have uniform spread, so that by the time the centering is done over any mini batch, the data are properly centered. And then once you've centered it, you want to shift it, right? And shifting is a two-step process again. First, you find a new location for it, which is beta. But if you just move it to, uh, to that new location, the spread is still going to be just unity because we've normalized it out. So then you're going to scale it by some gamma, which gives each, give each neuron its own spread. So we have this two-step process, which BN performs. And this is done separately for each neuron in the network. Um, yes, Prasad? If we uh, do a random shuffle while training, we should not be expecting any covariate shifts in our... It still happens, right? The point is, regardless of how you sample it, each batch is going to be a some, some sample. So, and moreover, you may not actually say, the network has this way of segregating data as you go through the network. You may not see this at the input by the time you get to the fourth layer, the representations you get may end up being segregated. That's because it just sort of moves things out, right? And different groups get moved in different directions. So here is the entire process. Within any batch, mini batch, the first thing you do is you're going to aggregate the statistics over the mini batch. So you're going to compute the mean of the mini batch. This is again per neuron. So you know the, the, the uh, affine value coming in is just a scalar, right? So you're going to be computing the mean of that scalar. You also compute the standard deviation, the variance of that, of, the, of that affine value. This is computed over the entire mini batch. Then for every instance in the mini batch, you are, you are subtracting this mean and dividing by the standard deviation. This epsilon over here is just meant to make sure that things don't go to zero. There are, 
if you have no variance at all, then you're going to get a divide by zero problem, so you have the plus epsilon, right? So this first step basically normalizes, centers the data. And then the second step, this block over here, shifts the data to the new location, which is gamma u plus beta. So there's the second step. Now, I can sort of redraw the whole thing to give you a better idea of what's happening over here. This first step centers the data. Then the centered data is multiplied by some gamma, and then you add a beta to it. Now, one of the benefits of this is that you don't need, because you're actually shifting everything to the new, a new position, a bias term no longer matters. You don't need to compile, compute an affine value of the inputs because the bias would get canceled out when you are centering the data, right? So when you're applying batch normalization, using a bias is a very useless thing to be doing because it's going to give you absolutely no computational you know, or algorithmic advantages. Where do you come? No, the ReLU is not zero center. The ReLU is basically a, 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 it's a rectification. Think about this, right? The ReLU is, oh shoot. The ReLU is performing something like this. You might imagine that your data are all out here for, because of whatever variance you've got, variation you've got. You center it, it's going to be out here. And then you shift it, it's going to be out here. Some things will still continue to get cut, right? So basically, you're trying to match the overall statistics of the training data, right? We don't know where it is centered, or where it should be centered at that, po at that position, at that point in the computation, forward computation. So yeah, you guess it. OK. Now, this sort of throws, yes, yeah, Soren? If you, you, could, you could do more complex things, it's just going to make things more ugly, okay. right? So why would you go? This, this works just fine, right? So here is the problem that you, you can see something funny that's happening over here. In your conventional training, the mini batch loss is simply the average of the divergences for the individual training instances. And for any individual training instance, the output of the network is it a function of the other instances in the training batch, in mini batch? Yes or no? no. Say it aloud. No. Okay, why not? Kunal. So are you considering any other training instance, instance when you're processing one training instance? No. 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 So obviously each instance is individually processed, right? Which means that when you compute the derivative of the divergence, then you're basically computing the derivative of the divergence for the individual training instances, which is why you can do this locally for each training instance. When I'm performing batch normalization, does this hold? Why not for you? Okay, I know she, I know she knows the answer. She's trying to str struggling with her words a bit, but here's what happens. Every instance is being centered at each point, correct? So that means the output that you get is also a function of the mean and the standard deviation of the mini batch because that's what's being used to shift the data, right? That means the divergence for each training instance depends not only on that instance, it depends on every other instance in the mini batch. And this causes a problem. So a nice way to think about it is that the computation we perform has this structure over here. That this is again at a single neuron. You're not speaking of a vector input, okay? This guy is the, the set of affine values for the mini batch coming in to, to batch normalization. And this is the set of normalized affine values where the things have all been shifted, you know, centered and shifted, right? And now, because the center and the standard deviation is basically an aggregate statistic, 
every single input over here is going to influence the mean and the variance, right? So when I see how this guy is transformed from Z1 to Z1 hat, that transformation is also influenced by the value of ZB over here because every one of them influences the mean and the variance, right? So here's the actual computation that happens. Batch normalization, I'm just sort of uh, uh, showing the insides of this orange box over here. The, so the uh, way, way you want to think about it is that batch normalization is a vector operation, but now the vector is not the components of the data. It's the mini batch itself. All the affine values in the mini batch are going in jointly and coming out jointly, right? So here's what the computation looks like. Here are all of the affine values. Again, this is at a single neuron going in to the uh, batch norm. And then every one of them influences the computation of the, of the mean, right? You can see why this is the case. If I have all of these instances, let's say I have Z1, Z2, maybe you guys can help me draw the influence diagram. Every one of them is going to give me the mean of the mini batch, correct? What about the variance of the mini batch? What are all the terms that, so you over there, can you shut the laptop, if you don't mind? Yes, thank you, right. I shouldn't have to ask you guys to shut your laptops. It's uh, impolite, okay? Anyway, now, what are all the things that influence the standard deviation, the variance? Maybe Iman, you can tell me. Pardon me? So the, all the Z values are going to be influencing the standard deviation, right? Because all of them, what else influences it? The mean, correct? So this is the computation that you have. And then when I'm, no, when I'm normalizing this to get Z1 hat, what are all the terms that influence it? Maybe you can tell me, Shirja. Um, the mean the... So the, all of these are going to be influencing it, right? And you can see this is ugly, correct? Now, here's the other thing. Uh, now, if I want to compute the, uh, so I'm going to get a similar one for each Z, right? And every one of these guys is going to be finally after influencing the divergence. So if I want to, yes? Um, why does the mean uh, influence the variance? Because it isn't the data, doesn't the data stream already have that information in it? It's as a variable it does, correct? Okay. When you compute the derivatives, you'll find it goes away, right? So now, so when I compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to any z, I have to consider all of these guys, every path, going backwards. But the nice thing is, once the normalization is done, the activation is individually applied, right? So now, if I'm going to perform back propagation, I can compute the derivatives for each of these u's individually, because the processing after the computation of u is independent for each u. Right? So now back propagation, just look at an individual neuron. This was your forward pass, right? You got all of these, uh, no, you got these Z's. You got the Z's for many different training instances. You got the mean Z, you got the variance. You use those to compute U. Those were scaled and shifted to give you the Z hat. Then you applied the activation function to Z hat, which was this formula. So. I mean, Z hat was obtained by shifting and scaling U, and then you applied an activation to it, right? When you're performing back propagation, the first thing you're gonna get going back is the derivative of the divergence with respect to Z hat. Going back this far is a non-issue. This is just your standard back propagation. Now, if I want to take the derivative back from Z hat to U, what are the things I have to worry about? Tala. Look at the equation here. So again, we said the shift and the scaling were neuron dependent, right? Are there any parameters in the translation from U to Z that must be estimated? Gamma and beta, right? So now, 
if I've already got the derivative with respect to z hat, what must I do to learn gamma and beta? I must also compute the derivative with respect to those two, right? And so maybe, Gopi, you can tell me what is the derivative with respect to gamma over here as I take this backwards? So the derivative of law, the loss with respect to gamma is going to be ui. ui, right? And what is the derivative of the loss with respect to beta? Uh, that's this is this ui? Are you sure? You're missing a term. OK, I'll help you, right? <laughs> it's a chain rule. You just gave me the derivative of z hat with respect to gamma. But if I want to compute the derivative of the loss with respect to gamma, there's going to be u times the derivative of the loss with respect to z hat, right? If I want the derivative of the loss with respect to beta, it's just the derivative of the loss with respect to z hat. So we are fine so far, right? I can take a step back, and now uh, can someone at the back tell me what is the derivative of the loss with respect to u? So this person at the very back with the striped shirt. So the derivative, is it gamma? Derivative of the loss with respect to u. You're, you're missing the chain rule part of it, are you not? So that's actually going to be the derivative of the loss with respect to z times gamma. You missed the chain rule, correct? And so when I work my way backwards, I can get up to this point considering individual training instances. And for each training instance, I can get a derivative with respect to gamma. I can get a derivative, derivative with respect to beta. And finally, I can get a derivative with respect to u. So all fine. At this point, this is where we have, we, we are, we've got the derivatives with respect to all of these u's, right? And now we must compute the derivatives of these u's with respect to z's because we want to get the derivative of the divergence with respect to every one of the z's in the mini batch. That's what you're going to back propagate, correct? And that is complete, that, that's going to be ugly. But there's a point. There are two questions. Five seconds, guys. All right. So in batch norm, the normalized value ui for any zi depends on all the zi's in the mini batch, right? We know this. And the normalized value of ui doesn't depend on the other ui's. The ui's are occurring at the same level. It depends on every single zi, right? And basically, you can think of batch norm as a vector operation over all the inputs in the mini batch. This is what we've clarified. Now, we're going to try to figure out within just this normalization centering stage. So we've taken, we've dealt with the shift because the shift could be handled individually for every training instance. But then, yes, now the centering thing is not, is, has to consider the data as, as a, the entire mini batch as a unit, right? So this makes the computation of derivatives a little challenging. So we're going to try to sort of complete this figure, and we're going to try to figure out what the derivative of the divergence, which, is, which would be out here, with respect to each of these z's is going to be. So now, let me ask you guys. Maybe you guys can spend 10 minutes helping me work out the derivatives, all right? Uh, so let me actually draw the figure out this way. This is mu. 
this is sigma squared and this is z1, z2 and so on, right? All of these are going to influence the derivative, the divergence. So maybe this lady here, you can tell me what the, what the derivative of the divergence, the chain rule for the derivative of the divergence with respect to z1. What's that going to be? There's a derivative of the divergence, I'll call this a loss with respect to. Actually, let me call these, these are not the z's, these are u's, right? u1, u2, I'm sorry, right? So what is each u? times the derivative of ui with respect to say z1, right? And is there a summation here, right? You have to sum this because you have to compute all of these paths. Everybody clear with this, right? If so, raise your hands. Okay, now this is a bit complex because you saw this in your homework and you probably wondered where that ugly equation came from. So we're gonna spend a little time on this. So this is what the derivative actually looks like, right? Now can somebody tell me, Esteban, can you tell me what are all uh, the, uh, let's con now, now consider any single variable, right? Z1, you need the derivative of every one of these u's with respect to Z1, if you want the derivative of the divergence with respect to Z1, right? So let's consider this first part, the direct path which is u1 with respect to z1 itself. So Esteban, what are all the dependencies you see over here between u1 and z1? Um, it would be from z1 to u1. Okay, okay. Wait a second, so this, by the way, so I just failed to mention, this has already been computed so far, right? These are the terms we want to compute for every ij pair. And so you just told me that you have that path, okay? Anything else? So these are all the three paths through which u1 relates to z1, correct? And we also have the relationships, how mu relates to the z's, how sigma relates to the z's, and how u relates directly to the z, all on the left-hand side, okay? So now this means that if I actually write the derivative for the full derivative of u1 with respect to z1, there are three terms to compute, contribute, to, to consider. The first one is the partial of u1 with respect to z, z1 over the top path. The second one is the, is the partial of derivative through mu, but then there's a chain rule over here, right? So that's going to be the derivative of u with respect to mu times the derivative of mu with respect to z1, right? And then there's finally this path. Once again, there's a chain rule. There's the derivative with respect of u with respect to sigma squared and then there's the full derivative of sigma squared with respect to z. So again, I'm not writing this in terms of partials, but if I want to look at the derivative of sigma squared with respect to z, again, there are two paths from sigma squared to z that I would have to consider, right? Everybody clear with this? Raise your hands if you got this figure. Okay, fine, thank you. So, Sigma squared is influenced by mu, which is influenced by z. Correct? Oh, so again, you'll have to take the derivative of variance with respect to mu and z. So we will have to, okay, you're going to have, but you agree there are two paths, right? I've just drawn the influences. Oh. Anybody have a question about this? Does this, this has got to be obvious to everyone, right? So now, let's work out the math. What is the derivative of ui with respect to zi, the straight path? Someone, can someone guess, can someone tell me? Kunal, what's it gonna be? Pardon me? One, so the derivative of u with respect to z is going to be one, what? One by? One over sigma squared, right? So I have the derivative of ui with respect to zi. <coughs> 
equals 1 over square root of sigma squared plus epsilon. Everybody agree with this? Right? Straightforward. So if I, if I consider this one here, that's just going to be this. OK? Now, Sahana, help me with this one. What is the derivative? So I just replaced the first term. What is the derivative of ui with respect to mu b? The derivative of ui with respect to mu b is going to be? Can you say that aloud, please? Minus 1 over square root of sigma squared plus epsilon. Everybody agree with this? Right? So that's what it is. And may, let me replace that over here. Now, so what is the argaja, right? Can you tell me what the derivative of mu with respect to z is? Pardon me? The derivative of mu with respect to zi is simply going to be 1 over b, correct? Everyone agree with this? Anyone who, yeah, raise your hands if you got this. If you didn't agree with this, okay, everybody should have got it. How many disagree with this because some hands were not raised? How many of you are asleep? <laughs> okay, so thank you, Rohan. Uh, no. So that's what this gave you, right? So we, let me replace that in the equation as well. We have done the first two terms of this derivative. Now here we have the last two terms. What is the derivative of ui with respect to sigma b squared? So Prithvi, can you tell me? I'm looking at the derivative of ui with respect to sigma b squared. So what is that? So the derivative of ui with respect to sigma b squared squared is going to be minus 1 over 2 times sigma squared b plus epsilon over minus 3 over 2. Everyone agree with this? Raise your hands if you agree with this. Yeah, this is very straightforward, right? So that's what it is. Someone forgot something. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Everybody agreed with it blindly. You're not listening. OK, watch out. Your classmates make mistakes. And I just found like 100 people making the same mistake. Shame on you. OK. Uh -huh. So. The next time, you guys are not going to make that mistake. All right. So let's plug that equation in. Now here's this last bit, right? There are two separate parts over here. So uh, maybe, Yuching, can you tell me what the derivative for? If I had to expand this out, what would it look like? Can you say it aloud, please? There are how many paths are there? Two. Two. Okay. So can, now, can you tell me what the derivative is going to be? Are you sure? I just want the four. Oh, what happened? Something happened. I've very helpfully drawn both paths for you. So now, maybe you can tell me what the derivative is going to be. OK, Aishwarya, can you help me? Yeah, it's the derivative with respect to zi. It's a de it's, is it the partial or full? Partial. It's going to be the partial of sigma squared with respect to zi. Mu b. That's it? Times something what? Can some one person answer me? Yes. <laughs> 
this is going to be mu with respect to zr. This is what you would need, the whole thing, correct? Everyone agree with this? OK, someone didn't agree. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> right? So you guys are not paying attention, right? It, they would be the same in this case, but all right. <laughs> but if you have to be didactic, you need that, right? You, there were notes. You must have seen the notes on Piazza. All right. So let's try to get this one. What is this one? Can someone help me? So Ryan, what's that? The derivative of sigma squared with respect to zi. Yeah. Pardon me, can you say that aloud? It's from the second equation, right? It's going to be 2 over b. Zi minus, here, right? Don't keep missing that term, guys. OK, so we've got this. I've replaced it. Now what about the second term here? What, we, what is the derivative of sigma squared with respect to mu b? So An, can you tell me? Can someone? Yes. That, that, so derivative of sigma squared with respect to mu, mu b is going to be what? Are you sure? Observe, that, observe what this is over here. So can someone, OK, Maxwell, you help me. Thank you. Right, that's going to be summation. Continue. Uh huh. So that there's going to be no negative two. There's, yeah, there's a negative two outside, yeah. zi minus mu b, right? Yeah. What is this summation over here? Can anyone tell me? Zero. That is zero, correct? Because the summation of z, the average of z is just the mu, mu minus mu is zero. So this term, if I write it out, it just becomes zero. Right? So which goes to what? Uh, was it uh, Neil? You pointed out, right? And so this term is 0. I can get rid of it altogether. And so this simply becomes 2 zi minus mu b over b, right? It looks very ugly. It looks ugly primarily because of the plus epsilon. But then if I write it all down, this is what it looks like. This is the derivative of ui with respect to the corresponding zi when you're going on the straight line, right, the same zi. This is the formula that you saw in your batch normalization, one of the formulae, OK? But then there's another kind of derivative that I need to compute over here. What would that be, Rohan? The, the non, right? And how is that going to be different from this guy? You're not going to have the first term. That's all you're going to miss, be missing. And so this is simply going to be this here. And that's, this is identical to the i equals j situation without the first through term. And that's simply going to give you this formula. right? Everybody with me so far? Raise your hands if you're with me. OK, so here is the derivative of the u's with respect to any uh, of the uj with respect to any zi. If j equals i, which is the through, through term, you have it's a sum of three terms, 1 over sigma squared plus 1 over minus 1 over b sigma squared. I can actually group these guys up, I guess. Minus sigma i, I mean zi minus mu squared over the squared, yeah. Yeah, over b times sigma squared raised to 3 over 2, right? And if it's not a through term, you just get the second, second and the third terms. And now, the complete derivative of the mini batch loss with respect to zi is going to be summing over all of these guys, correct? So the sum over all of the u's of the derivative of the loss with respect to the corresponding u times the derivative of the u with respect to that z. So if I were write it out, here's what it looks like. 
This is the formula for the derivative of u r u j with respect to z r. Everyone with me, right? And so I'm going to be plugging this formula into the derivative of the loss with respect to zi for any given zi. So this first term only occurs if j equals i, so that comes out all by itself. The derivative of the loss with respect to ui times 1 over sigma squared, right? Now these next two terms are common for all j's. So I can just write this as some minus of 1 over sigma squared b times the summation or the derivative of the loss with respect to the uj. And then minus 1 over, once again, 1 over uh, b times the variance raised to 3, to, uh, 3 over 2, times the derivative of the loss times, with respect to uj, times z minus mu whole squared. Okay? So this, is, this formula looks kind of, I, I know I'm reciting it. If I just pulled out the 1 over sigma squared separately, you will see something interesting happening over here. Let me write this out. I won't bother with the, with the plus epsilon. I can just write this as 1 over sigma squared. And the first term is d loss over d ui minus 1 over b summation i d loss over d ui, correct? Plus whatever, uj times minus 1 over b times sigma squared, summation j, d loss over d uj, and that's going to be zi minus mu squared. That's what we've got. That's just for 1 zi, OK? And now, observe what happens over here. What is this term? If all of the instances in the mini batch were identical, what would this become? What would it become? This is just the mean of the mini batch, correct? If all of the instances in the mini batch were identical, what is the derivative difference between the loss for an individual instance and the mean loss over the mini batch? They are both the same, correct? This term is going to become 0. What about this guy? I can just pull the dl over du out. The rest is just the variance of the mini batch. If all of the instances are the same, what is the variance? 0. zero. What will this term become? So if all of the instances in the mini batch are the same, what is the net derivative you're going to get going through? Everybody say it aloud. Zero. zero, right? You want the mini batch to have diversity. If your mini batch is not diverse, the derivatives that go through the batch normalization layer are going to be minuscule, and they're basically going to mess up your training. Right? And so here's the complete batch norm. Once, once you've done the batch norm, go, you know, gone through this de derivative computation, you're going to have the derivatives with respect to all of the z's for the entire mini batch. And now that's just, the, you know, from there you can continue with your standard backdrop, but then you have to be concerned about this. Your mini batch itself must approach as far as possible the training data. The greater the diversity it has, the more this whole process is going to give you meaningful derivatives. And so although batch normalization norm nominally sort of accounts for shifts, between mini batches, if the mini batches themselves don't have some diversity within them, if they don't have variance, this whole thing is just going to die on you and, and not block the training. The batch normalization layer is going to kill your training, right? And so you have a problem. Okay, we'll stop this one early, guys. Five seconds. <laughs>
All right. Block norm effectively ba blocks backpropagation and prevents gradient computation if all the instances in the mini batch are identical or very similar. We just showed this, right? Now, what about during inference time, forward computation? Now, when you're testing, you're not operating on mini batches, you're operating on individual instances. Obviously, this business of shifting to a standard location must still apply to the test instance, right? So this entire computation must be followed, but then you don't really have a mean for the mini batch or a standard deviation for the mini batch in the forward process. So what we will normally do is to maintain the average of the mini batch means over all of the training data. Similarly, you're going to maintain an average of all the, all the standard deviation, the, the variance means over the entire training data. And these are what are going to be applied in your actual normalization on test data. Again, on test data, you don't really have a batch. So the mean that you use to center the data is going to be the mean of the means of all of the mini batches in training. The variance that you're going to use to normalize it is going to be the mean of the variances of all of the variances in training, right? So uh, now you actually have, this is some, something called a uh, unbiased estimator for the variance. It's a final wiggle, something that's not particularly uh, key. So now batch norm may be applied only to some layers or even to some selected neurons in the layer. It improves both convergence rate and neural network performance. And anecdotal evidence is that it eliminates the need for dropout, which we will see in a minute. Now, to get the maximum benefit from batch norm, learning rates must be increased and learning decay rate must be faster because the data are all normalized and centered. It means that you're working with steeper derivatives most, more, more often, which means larger learning rates can be used and they will actually get you to the optimum much faster. And uh, again, you need better randomization of the training data because as you saw, if the data begin to clump, BN can actually hurt you. Yes? Um, uh, so we started off with trying to solve the problem of covariate shifts, but if the different mini batches have a lot of covariate shifts, then the different news and different uh, vari variances will be dif different. Correct. And at inference time. You're, 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 taking the, you're, you're taking a mean of all of those because that's the best you can do. That's all it is. But that might be much different than what the mini batches are. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a risk you run. Yes. Yes, Jeffrey? We'll talk about it. It doesn't need, again, this is an empirically observed uh, you know, statement that batch norm doesn't eliminate the need for dropout. But uh, I don't know of any rigorous proof which uh, says why the two must cancel each other out. And uh, here are some results from uh, you know, EOF and Zegedi, Sergey EOF and Zegedi, back when this batch norm was first published. And they showed how you know, when standard training takes so many epochs to train, if you have something which batch normalization, you get the same level of convergence or maybe even better in far, you know, far lesser time simply because data keep getting normalized and the training is effective, more effective, right? So story so far, gradient descent can be sped up by incremental updates. Convergence can be improved using smooth updates. The choice, the choice of divergence affects both the learned network and the results. Covariate shift between training and test may cause problems and may be handled by batch norm. We've seen this. Now, a lot of what we said is based on the assumption that somehow when you fit the model to the training data, things will work. You know, we attempt to learn an entire function from just a few snapshots of it. And, you know, maybe you minimize some error, but there's nothing stopping your network from doing this, right? So how do you ensure that the network in the process of learning those points the network doesn't, yeah, Gopi? Uh, I had a question. So if you're learning the uh, distribution of the data, does this mean that batch norm makes the network generator instead of? We are not learning any distribution of the data so far, right? Um, but like when we calculate the means and the variance. That's just the mean, that's just the estimated mean of that mini batch, right? 
you're assuming that mini batch has its own local distribution, you're estimating the mean and variance. That's all you're doing. But it's not being used as a generative model. Right. Neil? I have another question about batch now. Um, that batch model, what is the data that you're using to predict more? In the process of, again, in the process of normalizing, everything ends up getting, you know, uh, during the centering, everything ends up getting a standard uh, variance. But then remember, things get scaled, so it doesn't fully do so. Depends on gamma, right? OK. So how do we prevent this? Yeah? Yeah, so basically, this red curve is horrible, right? You don't want it. So the question is, how do you prevent it, right? And you need additional smoothing constraints that will fill in the missing regions acceptably. So now, exactly how far off are we in terms of how much, how small our training data is? To give you an idea, I sort of skipped the slides, but assume that you're just working on maybe a 100 cross 100 images where the pixels are binary valued, right? 100 cross 100 images, 10,000 pixels. Each of them are binary valued. So binary valued data live on the corners of a binary hypercube. We know that, right? So 10,000 dimensional data lives on the corner of a 10,000 dimensional hypercube. If you want to specify a function entirely, you're going to need to specify 2 raised to 10,000 points. If I give you 1 trillion training instances, you haven't even begun to make a dent on how much data you really need to specify the function fully. So to give you, a, give you this simple illustration, if I were just training on binary data, every pixel value input takes value either 0 or 1, then all of the data are going to live on the corners of some high dimensional hypercube, right? And your training data are going to be some small number of samples over here. If I gave you for this 100 cross 100 image, which is a very small dimensional input, 1 trillion training instances, and then I put you in a little mini rocket. I just plotted all of these guys on the corners of a hypercube. I put you on a mini rocket and said, you can travel at any speed so long as it's not the speed of light. Just travel along the edges and find me a training data instance. The, the universe will end before you find your first training data instance. That's how sparse the training data are. There are no data. You're basically giving the network the equivalent of one sample per dimension and asking it to estimate a whole function. Obviously, this is not going to work, OK? So we need additional smoothing constraints that's going to ensure that the function gets filled in somewhat cleanly, right? What can these things be? Now, think of a simple binary classifier where the output, you have a single, single where you have a, a simple logistic function at the output, right? But this applies everywhere. You know, this, I'm just using this as an illustration. Now, if these are your training data, this is what you would really want, correct? Your neural network is infinitely flexible. It can train this, learn this function instead. Do you want it to learn this function? Obviously not, right? So why can it learn this function instead of the smooth one? That has to do with the fact that our learning is unconstrained. And now, if assume that uh, I'm using, now, regardless of the activation, but I assume for now that we're using sigmoid activations. For the network to learn something of this kind, these neurons must permit changes in the function that are fast enough for the final network to change so fast, right? Which means that, now, when can this, these neurons change that fast? Assume that all of them have sigmoid activations. Again, this has nothing to do with sigmoid. This generalizes to other activations as well. A sigmoid activation has this 1 over e raised to minus wx. As w gets larger and larger and larger, the sigmoid gets steeper and steeper and steeper, right? In the limit, it can actually become a step function if w is infinite. So which is why if I let my sigmoids just learn, then the sigmoids can all become arbitrarily steep, and they can actually let me learn this crazy function, right? So what would the uh, remedy be over here, Owen? Rohan, 
you basically make sure the weights don't get too large, right? So constraining the weights to be low is force, going to force the network, the perceptrons to vary more slowly, and the network to learn smoother functions. And so that's what we will do. This is your standard loss. It's going to be the average of the divergences over the entire training set. And your conventional training is simply going to minimize this loss. We're going to modify it a bit and say we're going to not, I want to not only minimize the loss, I also simultaneously want to minimize the weights of the neurons themselves. So this is a standard regularization, uh, rigid regression, which makes sure that the uh, individual perceptrons do not permit the uh, changes that are so fast that the network can end up learning something very specific to your training data and missing the smoother function that you really want. And this lambda over here is a regularization parameter that determines uh, how much importance you give to this guy. Is Kunal? Uh, other than pinpoint, uh, pinpoint, other kind of regular, regular activity functions, how can you actually have less weight or if you constrain the weight, the changes So pardon me, I couldn't understand you. Uh, So the point is in all, even if you're using a ReLU, the weights are going to give you the steepness of your slope, right? If in all of the functions, the weights basically determine the steepness of your activation. So way of the weight, you don't want the slope to be That's basically it. That's about it, right? And so uh, this is, and that you can do by just simply adding this extra regularization term that must also be minimized. And the value of lambda that you choose determines how much importance you assign to the requirement that the weights be low. And that's something that is usually found out empirically. The best way to find out is you know, just test it or test out different lambdas. But then once you have that, the way the derivative is going to change is that the derivative of half, again, the half over here is to ensure that uh, you know, when you take a derivative, the twos cancel out. It, it has this very nice effect, oh, go away, right, that uh, the only thing that changes as far as the derivative is concerned is that now, instead of the standard derivatives you had with respect to the, the weight matrices, you also add in a little bit of the previous weight matrix itself. And that's going to, uh, and you try to make this, uh, uh, and you're going to use this modified derivative in the gradient descent, right? Again, you can sort of intuit why this must be so uh, in that, uh, you're moving against the weight, observe. So if the weight is large, it's going to try to decrease the weight. And the larger the weight is, the more it's going to try to decrease the weight. Because that's what this W is doing over here, right? Which makes a, kind of makes intuitive sense. And if you looked at the pseudocode, that's the only change that happens. There's another way of imp implying, uh, imposing smoothness. And this is through network structure. It turns out that for a given number of parameters, deeper networks impose more smoothness constraints than shallow ones. And this has to do with the fact that, guys, I may go a few minutes over, just bear with me, right? This has to do with the fact that when you have many layers in a network, each layer operates on the output of the previous layer. So when you have some input trickling in, if the first layer computes, you know, the, what, whatever the network, network is, is, uh, is the first layer is going to compute some function over the inputs. And assuming that your neurons are all properly regularized, each layer is going to smooth out the output of the previous layer. It's going to make the function smoother and smoother and smoother as you go through the network. And so for a given number of neurons, having a deep but narrow network is going to give you much greater smoothness to your function than having a shallow but a wide network. And so here's a little example of how that works. This was a binary classification problem. And here I want an, uh, these are the decision boundaries. I want an output of one in the white regions and a zero in the black regions. We know exactly how many neurons we would need to compose something of this kind, right? We need th three neurons for the triangle, three neurons for the square. I can or the two. So if, suppose I take an optimally structured network. And then I get a great number of examples from here. And try to train the optimally structured network, which we know can solve this problem. Here are the decision boundaries you get. Nothing like what you really want, right? 
So clearly just having optimal structures is not going to work. You need much more capacity than you know, the minimum capacity required for the network. But then let's take some other examples. Here, there's this hexagonal bolt, the shape of a bear. We have these networks with uh, a total of 660 neurons in this case. Here they're arranged as three layers of 220 neurons. This one is four layers of uh, 115 neurons. Six layers of 110 neurons, 11 layers of 60 neurons each. And you can see how for the same number of neurons, if I rearrange them as into deep networks, deeper but narrower networks. And again, in terms of parameters, this actually has fewer parameters than this guy, right? So if I keep arranging, rearranging them as deeper but narrower networks, you actually end up learning the decision boundaries much better. Because, again, because of this effect that when the network is deep, each layer is working on the output of the previous layer, things have already been smoothed. Same thing over here. As I make the network deeper, it begins to look more and more like the bear. And the alternate, of course, is you know you throw in tons of training data, then regardless of the network you use, things kind of work. Yeah. And when you make the network deeper, do you maintain the uh, layer width? No. So I'm using 660 neurons in each case. So all the layers have the same dimension. No, they don't. I have a total of 660 neurons here. Oh, total. So this is three layers of 220, 11 layers of 60. For the same number of neurons, make, rearranging them as, as a deep network gives you much smoother networks, yes, functions. Is this result purely uh, empirical, or is this, or is this only three cases? So this, this one, uh, there, there, there is a, you can show that these things have greater regularization because you have, because you have nested functions, each of which inter induces some smoothness. But then this one is empirical. But yes? They are related. I haven't actually gone through that in detail, so I can't answer that question honestly. Uh, but uh, the FI function and the activation function itself doesn't provide any uh, smoothness. So how can it be uh, smoother? Again, as I mentioned earlier, within each within within each layer, if you're if you're not uh, permitting arbitrarily smooth transitions, then things get things get smooth as as you nest them through. What is happening is that as you nest them through each, we'll get to this, we'll talk about this in a few more lectures when we talk about how gradients vanish as you go through networks and things like that, okay? So uh, if you allow the weights to be arbitrary, then all bets are off things can, in, 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 in principle, become infinite, right? So, so everything is assumed to be constrained over here. But uh, isn't this a type of implicit regularization? Yes, it is. So it should work without implicit regularization? Well, no, the point is this. If, I, if the function never becomes less jagged as you go through the network, then it's going to remain jagged, that's it. What will happen is the number of jags you get is going to depend on the width of the layers. And so in that sense, you will have, have fewer sharp transitions. So, so you're right. That will also give you some implicit regularization. Someone make a post about this on Piazza. We'll, expl we'll discuss this in a little more detail. Yeah, yes, Neil? Uh, what is your prediction we are not assuming, we are assuming that the functions you're trying to predict are smooth, right? I mean, I mean, it's very likely that this is really the function you want, and then you're screwed, right? <laughs> So that, that, that's what I mean. If this is your target function, this is my activation that you're talking about, right? Yeah. So just, you're still going to need steep. So, so the, we are making assumptions about the kinds of functions that you're going to estimate. And you're, you're making assumptions about how fast these functions actually can change. If your function is, has changes which are infinitely steep, then all of these things are going to hurt, right? Practices are easily 
So they all combine. You end up with deep networks with weight decay and dropout, right? And or dropout. But why would the weight decay technique be more preferred than the other explicitly? Wait, what is weight decay? That is, you know, random dropout or random decay instead of a. Not necessarily. Weight decay is just is just another form of regularization, right? So we are, we are literally constraining the weights in that case. You're shrinking the weights. So one final topic, which I'm kind of running out of time for, but I'll go, I will. Uh, the most influential topic has been dropout. Method has been dropout. So the, I'm going to go a few minutes over. Bear with me. I'll try to do this fast. Before we got speak of dropout, uh, this goes back way back when. One of the most popular ways of making machine learning models more accurate was this, something called bagging. You would sample your training data, and you train a, many, many different classifiers. And then each of them would make its prediction, and the final prediction would be an average, a vote across all of these individual classifiers. And it was shown that this actually improves classification performance a whole lot. There's a whole lot of theory and empirical results that back, this, back, that back this idea. So dropout tries to capture this idea. During training, at each iteration, we're going to turn off each neuron with some probability 1 minus alpha. So turning off basically means that I'm going to just remove it from the network. Now, in practice, you're not going to pull it out of the network. What you will do is multiply, just set all of those values to 0, so they're not really going to influence the output of the network. Now, this is going to be done differently for each training instance. So the, the subset of neurons that you're going to turn off changes for each training instance. So here, for example, the first training instance x1 may be viewing this network, x2 may be seeing this network, x3 might be seeing this network. And just to make it, make it clear that they're all seeing different networks, I'm going to erase these neurons. And this is what each of these guys is saying, right? Yes, Maxwell? Yes, within each, for each instance, they're going to be different, right? So the effective network is different for each, each neuron. And the back propagation that's performed is going to be over a different network for each, for each input, right? And the manner in which you do it is to have some masks. Uh, the, uh, there's the pseudocode on the slides that shows you how you would actually do the back propagation. Now, how many such networks can you compose? Observe that each training instance is actually seeing a different network, right? So if there are n neurons in your network, there are a total of two raised to n possible such, such subnetworks that you can compose. And so dropout is basically sampling, because you're switching off neurons randomly flipping by flipping a coin. What, there's no way you're going to be able to train all two raised to n networks. You don't have enough data. So what dropout is doing is sampling from this collection of two raised to n networks, and eventually learns a network that averages over all of these possible samples. So this is basically looks like a whole lot like bagging, right? Now, there's a second reason that dropout makes sense, that this is implicitly sampling from this very large collection of network uh, models. And so you get the implicit effect of averaging. But there's a second one. So when you begin sampling networks, or when you begin switching off things, then you're forcing each neuron to be looking at different subsets of features from the previous layer than every other, the, you know, each time it actually uh, sees the data. So now if you did have something of this kind, suppose you had, had a deep network, here is a possibility, which often happens within a layer you might find that there, within the network, you might find that one specific layer simply learns a pass-through transform. It just captures its input, passes it through clean without modifying it very much, and the rest of the edges simply, weights simply sort of go to zero. One weight maybe becomes one, right? So as a result, the effective network that you're learning is one layer less. Now, when you actually have dropout, very often this, this through line is going to get switched off. So this neuron is being forced to look out on the sides. And so as a result, you actually end up making each of the neurons learn a more diverse 
pattern and sort of forcing the neurons to actually work, whereas they could get lazy if you didn't have dropout. And so it has these two-sided benefits. The first is that you end up learning an ensemble. The second is that it learns each, forces each neuron to actually learn to perform a real classification task rather than just passing data through. So here's pseudocode for how you do that. Skip it. Now, when you're performing, when you're testing with dropout, again, dropout effectively trains two rays to n networks, right? So if you're thinking about it in, in terms of bagging, what is the classification task actually performing? The classification task wants to compute the output using each one of the two rays to n networks, and then you want to take the average over all of these guys. That is the bagging paradigm, right? But the problem is there's no way you're actually going to be taking an expectation over two rays to n networks. We do, we're not going to be able to compute it. So we're going to perform an approximation. We're going to say that an expectation of a network is a network of expectations. This is an approximation, right? And once I have this approximation, then what this means is that instead of trying to compute all two rays to n networks with things switched off and then averaging, I can do this locally for each neuron. What is the average output of the neuron if I switched it off with a probability of alpha? And then compute the output of the network using these, uh, the expected outputs of the individual neurons. Now, this is an approximation. This is not what you're supposed to be doing if you're bagging, but this is what is computationally feasible. And of course, doing this is going to be very easy. If I look at an individual neuron, each neuron is going to be switched off with some probability, switched on with some probability. Uh, uh, using some ra Bernoulli random variable D, right? Which has a probability alpha of being switched on. So the expected value of the output of the neuron across all two raised to n networks is alpha times y, right? Sigma. So this is what you will replace the expected, the actual output of the network by. Exactly how you will do it, there are different ways of doing it. Uh, the one standard approach is just to say, I'm going to compute the output and then multiply it by alpha, where alpha was the dropout ratio that I used during training. Another is to say, if I'm going to be computing alpha times sigma at this layer, that's the same as multiplying all the weights of the subsequent layer by alpha. And so you can just pre-multiply pre all the weights by alpha, and then now this is just standard inference, right? Or uh, alternately, you can say that during training, I'm going to scale down the outputs of all of the neurons by, uh, by the inverse of, uh, by, uh, you know, by alpha. So I multiply the output by inverse alpha. And then during test time, I don't actually have to modify the weights. So there are different uh, ways of dealing with the whole problem. But the concept, you get the concept of how dropout works and why it works. And there are a great many results that show that once you actually introduce dropout, uh, then the performance, you can get huge benefits in performance, again, the benefits are from two, uh, for, uh, due to two reasons. One is that you get the effect of bagging. The second is that you're forcing the neurons to work and not permitting them to become lazy, right? Uh, there are variations on dropout, zone out, drop connect, shake out, wide out, but they're all basic variations on the same basic idea. Instead of switching on neurons, you can switch, uh, switching off neurons, you can switch off individual connections. You can do this with groups of layers, et cetera. So, I'll uh, leave this on the slides. There are a few more tricks that are mentioned on the slides. Please take a look at the slides. Uh, you know, things like early stopping. This is an obvious thing. Gradient clipping. Again, you don't want if your loss function is very steep. Seeing very steep gradients can cause your back propagation to fail. So you can clip. You'd clip it. And other such tricks. Take a look at the slides. Thanks for your patience. See you on Wednesday. If you have any questions, post on PR.